Good afternoon. My name is Adrian Dix. I'm BC's Minister of Health. To my right is Dr. Bonnie Henry, BC's Provincial Health Officer. Uh, this is our COVID-19 briefing for British Columbia for Monday, July the 13th. We're honoured to be here on the territories of the Lekwungen-speaking people of the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations. Uh, tomorrow, Tuesday and Wednesday at around 3 o'clock, we'll be providing written briefings with uh, updates about COVID-19, new cases in British Columbia. On Thursday, there will be another in-person briefing here from Victoria, Dr. Henry and myself. On, uh, on Friday, there will be a written briefing. And then uh, the following Monday, there will be a written briefing as well, next Monday. And we'll be back here on Tuesday uh, at 3 o'clock as well. So that's the update over the next week. And with that, I'm honoured to introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry. Thank you and good afternoon. And I will um, correct you in that this is our COVID-19 update for July 6th, <laughs> not 13th quite yet. I know. I'm, 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 I was hoping. Um, so we have three reporting periods for today's update. Uh, Friday to Saturday, we had nine additional cases test positive for COVID-19. Uh, between Saturday and Sunday, we had 15 people who tested positive. And Sunday to today, an additional seven people. Um, that's a total of 31 people who have tested positive for COVID-19 since Friday, bringing our total in British Columbia to 2,978 people. That includes 1,008 people in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region, 1,570 people in Fraser Health, 132 people in the Vancouver Island Health Region, 203 people in the Interior Health Region, and 65 people in the Northern Health Region. We have no new health care outbreaks. Um, we remain with the four active uh, outbreaks in the health care system, three in long-term care and one in acute care. We've had an additional 11 uh, new cases in uh, those facilities, um, two of whom are residents, bringing the total of, to 393 residents and 246 staff who have been affected with COVID-19. So we currently have 166 active cases, of whom 16 people are in hospital, four of whom are in critical care or ICU. Sadly, we've had six people who have died over the, uh, the past three days. Four uh, in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region, all of them in long-term care, and two in the Fraser Health Region, um, one of whom was a, a person who uh, passed away earlier in June at Langley Lodge, um, but the death in review has been attributed to COVID-19. So this uh, um, brings our, our total um, a number of people who have died. Actually, I don't have the total in front of me, but we want to pass on our condolences to all of those, particularly the families of the people who have passed away over the last few days. As always, this is such a challenging time to have a loved one pass away, and we know that they are mourned by their family, by their caregivers, and their communities here in BC. We have 2,629 people who have fully recovered from COVID-19. As you know, over this past weekend, um, things have been um, progressing in terms of our new normal, and I know many of us have found many more people out on the streets um, enjoying the weather that we have here in BC and the many activities that we can do safely right now. But importantly, we are following the rules that we have established for those safe social interactions, the rules that are our foundation to be able to keep our, our economy going, to keep our social interactions going, to keep our businesses. And as we have seen, these new normal rules are very doable. We can live with these. Young or old, in the city, a small town, we can all do and must do the right thing. This means leading by example, like we have been doing in BC since the start of our pandemic, assuming the best in those around us. As we have seen an increase in the number of visitors from elsewhere in Canada in these last couple of weeks, many businesses who rely on visitors and tourism have retooled and put together safety plans to allow them to open the doors to other Canadians. And let's show other Canadians how they too can do their part when they're here in BC. 
Anyone who's new to British Columbia from elsewhere in Canada, whether they're coming for work or on vacation, needs to understand that here in BC, we are keeping our bubbles small. We're having smaller numbers of people that we're gathering with. We are maintaining our safe distance from others, whether it's in a store, on transit, or in our community. Using masks when it's challenging to maintain that safe distance. And always, always staying away from others and staying home if we're feeling ill. Anyone from outside of Canada who's here for essential travel or is returning home is required to follow Canada's quarantine order to self-isolate for 14 days prior to interacting with us in the community. And while this quarantine order is an important part of Canada's border protection, we remind all British Columbians to show kindness and understanding to those around us. We have to remember that many Canadians reside elsewhere and many of them are only now returning home. Many have returned home in the months since this pandemic started. So let's assume the best. And rather than offering judgment, continue to do what we have been doing with kindness and compassion. COVID-19 has created many, many uncertainties and fear, but we have built a path forward in British Columbia that will keep all of us safe in the weeks and months to help, uh, ahead. And we need to keep that balance so that we can continue to have visitors to our long-term care homes, so we can continue to go to restaurants, we can continue to meet with each other. And through our own personal efforts and actions, we can protect our communities, particularly our elders and seniors who we know are more vulnerable and our loved ones. We are in this together, but our public health teams are monitoring and managing all of the new cases that we have in BC every day, making sure that we have all of the contacts and we are doing our bit by minimizing the, those contacts that we have so that we can modify as we need and how we run our businesses, how we spend time with others. We've worked hard to flatten our COVID-19 curve in British Columbia and by continuing to stay vigilant, to follow our foundations and work together, we can continue to keep our communities, our families and our province safe. And in doing so, let's remember to be kind, to be calm and to be safe. Thank you very much, Dr. Henry. And this is uh, obviously a very somber day for us. Uh, six people are announcing the deaths of six people from COVID-19 in BC over the past three days. And uh, one of them, as Dr. Henry has said, is from earlier in June. But uh, we know uh, the price that COVID-19 has taken from us as a whole community. We know and can identify that in many ways. But to lose uh, six people all in long-term care uh, over the last three days is uh, is a source of enormous grief for the families involved, for the caregivers involved, uh, for the communities involved. And uh, we share that sense of uh, loss, that sense of grief with them and with the 183 people and their families who have passed away from COVID-19 since the beginning of the pandemic in British Columbia. It is uh, a, mo a moment, I think, of sorrow for all of us and we want to make sure that that sorrow is felt because I know people feel it throughout the province for all those families who have lost their loved ones. Um, I wanted to say that there as noted 16 people in hospital, nine in Fraser Health and seven in Vancouver Coastal Health and disproportionately in Fraser Health they're part of the outbreak at, uh, at Mission uh, at uh, the Mission Memorial Hospital. Um, obviously um, we are uh, uh, those are being monitored very carefully and I think on the question of long-term care and I wanted to speak briefly about family visits in long-term care that uh, on the question of long-term care uh, that continues to be an ongoing concern for all of us and everyone in the health care system all those people all those families who are struggling and are dealing with the situation at Holy Family and uh, at Mission Memorial and at other care homes in BC all those who have felt uh, the anxiety that comes with an outbreak being declared whatever its size since the beginning of this pandemic we're thinking of them and continuing to be concerned about uh, the outcomes for everyone in long-term care. As you know last Tuesday we announced uh, uh, updated requirements uh, with respect to uh, long-term care and uh, 
and, uh, so, and social and family visitation. Uh, health authorities are actively engaging with operators to support, me, support them in the development of plans, uh, plans uh, uh, in accordance with the requirements of the policy so that visits can occur in long-term care homes. It's expected that the majority of operators will submit their plans to health authorities this week and that social and family visitation for most of those um, uh, for most of those uh, facilities will start next week. It's important to remember that visitation may start sooner, as early as uh, this week, as early as uh, the, as they are coming days in some facilities and later in others, depending on the work required at each facility to meet the requirements. Visits, of course, must be scheduled in advance, and operators are required to maintain a list of visitors and their contact information. And I'll have more information on Thursday on the progress that facilities and health authorities have made on this important issue, uh, and we'll have that on Thursday, including the number of plans submitted and approved. As I usually do on Monday and Tuesday, I want to bring you an update on uh, on uh, PPE. Uh, in particular, as you know, uh, as we do as of last Monday, June 29th, we had procured since um, the end of March 5,933,095 are equivalent respirators. Uh, 22 million uh, 300,000 surgical or procedure masks, 2 million 301,000 pieces of eye protection, almost 50 million pairs of gloves, and over 2 million 825,000 gowns. Uh, this week, in the week since uh, last Monday, June 29th, um, we've received the following 15,342 N95 or equivalent respirators, 516,250 surgical or procedure masks. 3,665,250 pairs of gloves and 114,160 gowns. We'll continue to source and test our PPE and are working hard to pursue any and all credible leads for safe and effective product for, for our health care system. And uh, finally, just in closing, uh, as you know, on June 24th, uh, Premier Horgan and Dr. Henry announced our transition uh, to uh, our phase three of our COVID-19 response. And as we start the third week of this transition, one guided by science, prudence, and care, our commitment to stopping the spread stands. We know that physical distancing saves lives. We know that bending the curve, not the rules, has brought us to this point in our social, surgical, and economic renewal. We know that in our individual and collective BC effort with COVID-19, we made the difference. We also know that this continues to be with us in communities. 31 cases over three days but people also, six who have passed away. And it reminds us of how we are all linked in dealing with COVID-19. It's that linkage, that coming together, that work of everyone in the community that has brought us to this point. So is staying 100% all in on our BC COVID-19 response. And this summer, our, issue, our effort must continue this day and every day, no matter where we are in BC and no matter where anyone else is, anywhere else in the world. This summer is a welcome chance for all of us to catch our breath, to recharge and renew ourselves. By staying 100% committed to stopping the spread, we give the peace of mind and calm we seek and that we need in this period where we have this enormous challenge before us. Aujourd'hui, nous faisons le point sur le nombre de nouveaux cas pour trois périodes de référence de 24 heures chacune sur celle de, des 3 et 4 juillet, celle des, des 4 et 5 juillet, et ça de 5 jusqu'au 6 juillet, en mi-journée. Nous sommes attristés d'annoncer six nouveaux décès liés au COVID-19 dans le régime de santé de Fraser 2 et de Vancouver Coastal 4, pour un total de 183 décès en Colombie-Britannique. Nous offrons nos condoléances à tous ceux qui ont perdu leurs proches pendant cette pandémie. À ce jour, 2629 personnes dont le test de dépistage de COVID-19 était positif sont maintenant rétablies. Euh, oh, oh, as, as, pour la première période de référence, qui s'étend jusqu'au 4 juillet, nous avons eu neuf nouveaux cas. Pour la deuxième période de référence, qui s'étend jusqu'au 5 juillet, nous avons eu 15 nouveaux cas. Au cours des dernières 24 heures, sept nouveaux cas se sont ajoutés euh, pour une... Euh, Uh, et pour un total de 2978 cas en Colombie-Britannique. Uh, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. We're happy to take your questions. Thank you, Minister. As a reminder to callers on the phone, 
you are limited to one question and one follow-up, please take yourselves off mute. And if you wish to enter the queue to ask a question, please press star one. If you have entered the queue, please repress star one to ensure your place. First question today is from Hina Alam, Canadian Press. Hi, Dr. Henry. Uh, hope you're doing okay. Um, I was looking at this uh, new paper that's out today uh, where there are several scientists who talk about uh, airborne transmission of the virus. And I was wondering if you could explain what that means and what are your thoughts uh, 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 about this new paper and the concerns ra raised by these scientists across the world uh, about this airborne quality of the virus? Yeah, I, I think I, I want to start off by saying that, you know, uh, the WHO has been uh, doing an amazing job at trying to keep up with what is going on. And I think that there, the way that at least the report that I saw that was presented, um, uh, I... I, do, I don't think they presented the WHO perspective in a way that was, uh, I think it was more trying to foment a bit of, of controversy. Um, and what these uh, people were uh, looking at, and this is something that has been an ongoing discussion for many, many years, and COVID is only one of the latest um, viral infections in this case, where we have these discussions. We've had many of these discussions around influenza in particular, but certainly other ones as well. And where the challenge comes is we know that there is a, a gradation of how um, droplets come out when somebody coughs or sneezes or talks. And it is the smaller ones that can be breathed deep into the lungs, and it's the larger ones that are often deposited up in the back of the throat or in the upper part of the lungs. And when we talk about something in the, the healthcare world as being airborne transmitted, what we're talking about are, very, are viruses that are in very small particles that can last in the air for many, t many hours often and then can float in the air column and can be um, transmitted down the hallway or through the ventilation system, for example. And the ones that are we most commonly associate with that type of transmission are viruses like measles. Smallpox was one that could be transmitted through the air as well as uh, um, bacterial infections like tuberculosis. When we're talking about viruses like COVID and influenza, primarily they're in the larger droplets that are transmitted when you're close to somebody. And yes, we can find some of them and we can find some smaller droplets. Uh, there's a, a range of size when somebody's talking. But we know that the, the amount of virus and the moisture the virus needs to stay alive um, is, is a bit more for some of these viruses like influenza and COVID. So you're more likely to breathe it in. So in the fact that it's transmitted through the air, I think we're all um, on the same page about that. And the fact that it's not transmitted long distances in the air column, we're all on the same page about that. Where there's some challenges is how much of it is due to the small aerosols that are transmitted when I'm close to you, or the larger droplets that tend to fall out um, more readily. And how much of it do I breathe into deep into my lungs, and how much of it is uh, deposited in the upper airways. So it's really a bit of nuance, I think. Um, the WHO has always said, and we agree, uh, that when you are providing care in a health care setting for somebody uh, with COVID-19, with influenza, it is incredibly important to do a number of things. We have what we call a hierarchy of controls. It's not only about wearing a mask or a respirator. It's about minimizing the time you spend in the room, making sure that you do fastidious hand hygiene, that you wear um, both a respirator or a mask and eye protection as well, being incredibly important. So it's all of those things that we have in place that protect people. We know as well in the community, and we've said this over and over again, that it is when you're in close contact with somebody within two meters, within one meter, um, particularly if you're indoors where there's poor ventilation and you're coughing or sneezing or singing or hugging or dancing, those are the situations where you're much more likely to transmit this virus. And it is 
um, regardless of what size particle that you're um, breathing in at that point. So those are the situations that we know are most risky, and that's why the measures that we have in place focus on reducing those, making sure that we have um, space between us, making sure that we have increased ventilation. So we know, for example, um, that if in a number of the, the production, food production places where we had outbreaks early on, once we put in place measures like plexiglass barriers, like wearing um, medical masks or non-medical masks even, like ensuring we have safe distances we, between people, we stopped the transmission of this virus. So that tells me that these measures that we have in place to stop droplets are effective in most situations. When we're looking at some of the situations that we need to deal with around the world um, where there's a lot of people who are sick with this virus, um, whether it's in a healthcare setting or when, whether it's in a communal uh, accommodation where people are living together in close quarters. If there are a lot of people sick with this, the transmission can be explosive, and we've seen that. And we also know that it means that we are bombarded with virus in our environment, and it's much, much more difficult to stop the transmission because we need to be fastidious with cleaning, we need to cover our eyes and our mouth, and it's much more difficult to do that. And in a healthcare setting, one of the main reasons why we uh, were working so hard to make sure we weren't overwhelming our healthcare system, because we know when you have a lot of people sick, the burden of virus in the healthcare system means that you, um, any mistake that you make in putting on or taking off your PPE or being in close uh, uh, quarters with your workmates, though there's no uh, leeway that there's enough virus around that you may run a very high risk of being infected. So that's why we have in place the protocols that we do in our healthcare setting. That's why we've been so um, careful about minimizing cases in the community because the more virus you have around, the more chances that you're going to um, pass it on to others inadvertently. The one other thing I will say about it is, so I don't think it's either or. I think we need to take the precautions that are suitable for um, the, the environment that we're working in, and we know what those are in our healthcare system, and they have worked. We know what they are in our communities, and they have worked. The one other sort of complicating factor that can make it a challenge sometimes is some people shed more virus than others. And we can't tell ahead of time who that's going to be. So some people, um, for reasons that we don't know, um, even if they have mild symptoms, may shed a lot of the virus and may have a higher probability of infecting others. And if somebody like that attends a, a church service, we've seen that happen in a couple of places, or goes to a nightclub um, where there's, they have contact in a close environment, enclosed environment with poor ventilation with lots of people, we get very rapid explosive outbreaks. So it's not, I, I, I think this is uh, uh, something that we, we need to take into account and look at our own situations and come up with the best um, way of protecting everybody in those situations. And the best way to protect people is making sure that sick people stay away from others, making sure that we are keeping our safe physical distancing, putting in place the administrative things to reduce the number of people in that environment. Um, one of the reasons why we have been so um, anxious about having visitors in our healthcare system so that we can give people the time and the space they need to make sure we're cleaning properly, to make sure that we have the personal protective equipment that we need. So it's kind of a long answer. <laughs> Do you have a follow-up, Pina? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so with, uh, uh, Dr. Andy, you just said uh, we spend, uh, we, we should try and spend minimum time in a room. What does this mean for offices or uh, pubs or public transportation or restaurants, things like that? Yeah, well, that's why we have put in place um, the measures that we have to reduce the number of people in those environments. So restaurants, for example, maintaining the spacing between um, between tables, keeping the groups in those tables small. So we're, we have a limit of six people at a table. The reasons for that are so that you don't have those opportunities for the virus to spread between people putting up barriers. Those are the things that work. Same in an office environment, making sure we increase the ventilation as much as possible, including uh, natural ventilation. So that helps disperse 
the virus, if there is any there. But also really, really importantly is keeping people who may be sick with this out of those environments. And that's why it's so important to stay home if you're sick, to not go into work. And then all of those hybrid measures that we've put in place for the coming months to a year until we have an effective treatment or vaccine. This is where we have to find our balance, doing the things that we have put in place in our retail outlets and transportation. Those are the things that we know work to prevent transmission of this virus. Next question is from Vaughn Palmer, Vancouver Sun. Good afternoon, Dr. Henry. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I see a report out of Seattle where they're saying that although there's been this surge in cases in Washington State, they don't see any obvious link where they could say that the virus was spread by the public protests, by the large outdoor gatherings. They don't find significant links between people who have COVID-19 and them having acquired it uh, at one of these public protests. Um, do you have any indication here, one way or another, whether we've seen cases that were related to the big public protests we had here in British Columbia? Yeah, so there's a couple of things on that. And we had this discussion, I had this discussion with my colleagues in Washington and Oregon and uh, uh, last week. Um, but uh, the short answer is no, we have not seen. So we follow up every single case here in BC, as you know. Uh, currently, we do not have any cases that have been associated with the protests that took place. Um, I think there's a number of reasons for that. And uh, in talking with my colleagues in, in the U.S., um, it, it, they also have not seen surges related to those activities. And it is likely a combination of them mostly being outside, being shorter periods next to people, perhaps. Um, many people, at least here in B.C., keeping distances, um, wearing masks, and those things can help. I think particularly the outside nature of them makes a big difference. Having said that, what, where they have seen in the United States in particular, outside transmission is large groups going to um, parties and events on the beaches, for example, where they have had transmission between um, people who are spending time, even though it's outdoors, um, together in large groups in those settings. So there's something inherently different about what you're doing with a group of people partying on a beach um, versus uh, what we've been seeing with some of the, these protests. And um, that was surprising. I think many of us thought that it would be a similar uh, risk. But I think it, it has to do, similar to what we were just talking about, is that the conditions for spreading of this virus are spending a lot of time in close contact, face to face with somebody. Um, and particularly if you happen to be by somebody who's spreading a lot of virus. Do you have a follow-up, Vaughn? Yeah, I, I, I it, maybe don't have enough data yet, but is the suggestion here that it's related to time and the amount of time you're together and whether or not you're face-to-face, -face, not just a matter of how many of you there are, and maybe also what you're doing, whether you're making a lot of noise and partying or whether you're just quietly listening to someone give a speech? Absolutely. Um, and we've said that all along. It's what we call the three C's. So close contact over a continuous period of time in a closed environment are the ways that we know this is more likely to be transmitted. But yes, if we're in an environment and, you know, we, we say 15 minutes is a sort of minimum. Um, so, you know, I think the, the corollary of that is, the corollary of that is, um, that you're not likely to get infected by somebody walking past on the street. Even somebody running past you on the street, is, if, if they happen to be infected, um, you know, that's, those are not the environments where we're going to see this being transmitted. It's when you're spending time with people, when you're sharing foods and drinks with people, um, when you're partying, dancing, laughing, kissing, hugging, you know, those are the situations that are, you're much more likely to spread droplets to, between people. Next question is from Binder Sajjan, CTV. Hi, Dr. Henry. Um, a lot of people are watching what's going on in the United States with their case numbers and wondering when would it be possible to even think about reopening that border. And I'm wondering, I know this is a, a federal government decision, but in your mind, what would you like to see, you know, ideally or practically in terms of uh, 
taking that next step, I guess, to loosen border restrictions. Yeah, you know, obviously we're very concerned. We know that that's how we got into trouble um, back in March, is that we had a lot of people coming across the border. A number of our new cases are people who've either traveled or been in contact with somebody who just came back from the U.S. Uh, recently, in my home province of PEI had uh, contact with somebody who had come up from the U.S. after not having cases for, for several months. So it, it is a worry. It's very much a concern. We know there's quite a bit of travel across the border, but nothing like what we usually see. Um, I, I cannot see uh, vacation travel uh, this summer from the U.S., given the, the rates that we're seeing and how widespread it is in the U.S. right now. And it really shows us that once this virus starts to spread in the community, if we're not taking those measures that uh, many states took early on and you open up too much too soon and, or people aren't doing the things that we seem to be doing here very well in Canada and here in BC, um, making sure that we have these precautions in place, then you can get widespread transmission. And uh, though their hospitalization and ICUs are not being overwhelmed in the same way that they were early on. We are now, I mean, even young healthy people can get very sick with this. And if you have lots of people sick, then uh, the probability of having young people get very sick and die goes up dramatically. And we've seen that with some very young people who've died recently. So it is a worry. In terms of the border, it is a, a federal decision, but I know um, there's been ongoing conversations with uh, across the country. So I, I do see, um, you know, I was encouraging to make sure we had opportunities for families to, to reunify across the border. I know how challenging that can be. Um, but any further loosening of the restrictions needs to be accompanied by um, ensuring that people know the restrictions that they need to follow once they're here, including um, self-isolation for, for that incubation period. Do you have a follow-up, Binder? I'm just wondering, um, I know there would be discussions with you and your counterparts, but I mean, just given what's happening in the United States, is it possible even at this point to think about, you know, case numbers or trend lines that it would take to feel comfortable with reopening? Well, well, the, the U.S. themselves, they, uh, they have some uh, reopening um, criteria that they're following, and I, I know I'm very familiar with what they're using in Washington and Oregon, uh, for example, which is all very similar. The U.S. CDC has actually recommended a number of the criteria, so, you know, number of cases per, uh, per population and things like that. But importantly, and what we're doing here in BC, one of the things I keep saying that we're, we need to measure and that we are following every day is unlinked cases and our ability in public health to follow up every single case. And when um, you have people who are skilled at doing that and we can find people and link people and stop the outbreaks from spreading very rapidly, very quickly, and we've been able to do that here. Um, so once they get to that point in the U.S., I think that'll be very helpful. Um, and they were certainly doing a really great job of that in Washington and Oregon in particular and in Idaho and Alaska. And now it's, um, it's tipped the other way and they've become, have very large outbreaks where people have not been following um, safe distancing rules and things. So it's been a challenge for them. And we want, I mean, the best thing for all of us in North America is for Mexico, is for the United States, is for Canada to all have this virus under control. Um, so anything that we can do to support our colleagues in, in the U.S., um, we are trying to do. Um, so yes, it would uh, depend a lot about uh, how many outbreaks they're having, how many unrelated, unlinked cases and ability to follow up um, in pub with public health. Yeah. So, uh, I agree. I don't think it's any time soon. It's important to remember it's not just the issue of people visiting Canada. It's Canadians visiting the United States that would be uh, not possible at this point. Many of the st places we vi would visit, Washington and Oregon, are obvious, but also Arizona and Nevada and California. These are states where Canadians and British Columbians visit frequently. And uh, clearly, the trend line is entirely in the opposite direction. And this is true around the world. These have been the highest days for COVID-19. 
And what that reminds us of, I think, is the absolute need to continue to be vigilant in what we're doing here. One of the extraordinary things that's happened here is the work of people in public health, as Dr. Henry has said, in the contract, contact tracing they have done, but that is possible and practical, or much more possible and much more practical when the number of cases is, oh, the absolute number of cases is less. And uh, this struggle uh, that our American friends are having, but not just them, uh, in Mexico and in India and in other jurisdictions around the world, is a message to us to be humble about our successes and also to be vigilant to ensure that we continue um, to, uh, to be all in, as I like to say, against COVID-19 because uh, the consequences, economic and social consequences of having to go back on opening up the economy that we're seeing in 17 or 18 U.S. states right now are significant uh, and negative for all walks of life and all elements of society from the health care, from health care to the economy to our social interactions. Do you have a follow-up? That was it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Next question is from Martella Bernardo, News 1130. Hi, everyone. Um, I know you touched on this a bit during your opening statements, but for Dr. Henry, uh, how concerned are you about the fact that we're seeing people now only dying in long-term care homes and the concerns leading into family visits and how much you stress that we need to be careful that we're not bringing this virus into these homes again. Yeah, yeah you know, from the very beginning, we knew that uh, once this virus um, got into a long-term care home, the potential for people to die, and we've seen that in all of these, um, goes dramatically up. I think the the good news is is that we have reduced the amount of transmission in our community so much so that uh, we have very few people in hospital. We have very few people who are transmitting in our community. And that's why we feel we're at that balance where we need to allow more people to go into long-term care. But it is that balance. We have to keep doing what we are doing in our community settings, being mindful of our balance, being mindful of the numbers of people that we're in contact with. And if we have somebody who's in long-term care that we're going to visit, then we have to make that sacrifice of, of staying away from some of those settings where we might um, put ourselves at more risk. And we have to be absolutely fastidious about staying away if we're not feeling well at all. So those are the balances that we have to make um, as families, as communities, to make sure that we do protect our long-term care homes. And it really has been a progression. We've been opening up the surgery, we've been opening up our economy, we've been having more social interactions, and we have low enough rates in our community now that we can manage this as long as we all um, be mindful and considerate and conti continue to do what we've been doing. Do you have a follow-up, Martella? Yes, just regarding all of the chatter in the past week about Americans vacationing in BC and how you stress the importance of people trying to be compassionate and understanding that these people may be Canadians that might be coming across the border. Have you had any evidence yet of um, anyone vacationing from the United States that's exposing people to COVID-19? Have any of these cases been linked to, to those specific um, allegations? Not that I'm aware of. None of the cases that we have in BC have been uh, related to people that uh, we know have been here uh, from the United States. We know that there are essential workers, both Canadians and Americans, who come back and forth or across the border, um, and we have had um, people become sick once they're here in BC. Um, but not uh, anybody that I'm aware of who's in here um, in VZ vacationing um, when they shouldn't be. Next question is from Megan Curran, West Shore Voice News. Hello, Bonnie. Uh, thank you for taking my question. How do you feel that youth in BC have responded to the COVID-19 message about physical distancing and avoiding group activities? Do you feel the seriousness of the disease has become recognized by youth? Yeah, you know, I, I, I ask this question of young people in my life, um, and it, it, as it does with everything, varies. Um, most young people are very 
uh, community-minded. Many of them have gone through, I mean, this is a very difficult time for young people. The uncertainty, uh, particularly if you're graduating from high school this year, you know, it was not the experience you might have wanted. Um, and so I have a lot of empathy for young people and what they're going through. If you're starting university and suddenly everything's gone online, you're not sure what your job prospects are, these are very challenging times. And young people are social people in ways that, uh, um, w th that are challenging to, uh, to curtail sometimes. But I think the vast majority of young people in BC and across Canada are taking this very seriously. They're seeing what's happening to their families and their communities, and they're being respectful of each other. And I've been incredibly impressed by youth in, in British Columbia um, and how they have responded and the resilience that they've shown and the caring for their communities. Do you have a follow-up, Megan? No, I just wanted to say thank you. I'm an 18-year-old myself, just graduated from high school, so I completely understand what you have to say. And I just, on behalf of all youth, I really appreciate what you're doing for us. So thank you so much, Dr. Henry. Thank you. And you know what? I was just so impressed at first, you know, when everybody was saying, oh, graduation, you're, you're ruining everything. You're ruining my life, as, as some young people in my life told me. Um, but... The, the innovative and the, f the really neat ways people have uh, come together and celebrated that, I just, my hat's off to young people. Next question is from Michael Potestio, Kamloops this week. Hi there. Uh, we've had a long-term care, care home provider uh, express concerns to us about an in inability to compete uh, with the province when it comes to hero pay. Uh, she said the organization has been impacted financially by the pandemic, fewer residents and, and more money having to be spent on cleaning and PPE and increasing employee pay by uh, $4 per hour uh, as has been done by the government for public empl employees isn't feasible. So my question is uh, why are employees for privately funded health care excluded from hero pay and does it not concern you that care at private homes could be impacted if employees were to leave, job, leave jobs in a publicly funded home which may pay more? Well, you're specifically referring, I think, to the pandemic pay proposal. There's two sets of proposals, obviously. One is a single site proposal where there was a lifting up of, uh, of uh, employees to the, uh, essentially to the HABC uh, um, standard. And that occurred, and that's occurring across health authorities based on an order from the provincial health officer. So that's one set of things. The second is the issue of pandemic pay, which, was, which is... Uh, 16 weeks of, of pay in certain sectors and that uh, the only limitation was it went to many private uh, care homes but those that provide public services all those employees got that the only people that are excluded from that category are uh, exclusively are, are those that are serving uh, private care homes where the uh, expectation for pandemic pay would be from the employer uh, in those cases. So uh, this in British Columbia, I think our pandemic pay has been the widest of any jurisdiction in the country or at least as wide as any jurisdiction and wider than most jurisdictions. So more people are eligible, including people who, uh, who work uh, in for uh, for profit or nonprofit uh, long term care homes, for example, who uh, who are uh, who are essentially uh, serving the public through public beds. So we've ha we had a wide thing. I know some people would like it wider, and there's several proposals to widen it out. This is a federal provincial measure, and those were the ultimately have to make decisions about the limits of the size of the programs. And we, uh, our decision was to limit it uh, for that period, for that 16 week period where the pandemic pay was available, the $4 an hour was available. To, uh, to people who are contractors to government or g direct uh, government employees in those cases. Thank you. And do uh, you have a follow-up, Michael? I know that was it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next question is from Keith Baldry, Global News. Hi, Dr. Henry, Minister Dix. Thanks for taking my question. I don't want to belabor this particular point, but back to U.S. visitors and such. I know you've told since day one not to make, not to rush the judgment about why people are where they are in terms of traveling. We don't know their backstories. But I have to say, uh, anecdotally, the amount of queries we're getting from people who are angry that they see American license plates out there when, again, they don't know the backstory. Are you concerned at all that there might be sort of a, a rise of intolerance out there in people uh, just not behaving properly when we're, when we're looking at people with a non-British Columbia license plate? 
Yeah, I, I think it's a, a sign of the fact that, you know, this has been anxiety provoking, it's been frightening, it's been, um, we've all um, had to suffer and um, sacrifice to get through this last few months. And it worries us when we see um, people who may not understand our risk and our anxieties and our fears. And it, it is um, a reflection of, of fear and concern. Um, and sometimes that comes out as anger, and sometimes that comes out as intolerance. But I think for the most part, we need to take a step back and just realize we may not know everybody's backstory, and that we need to be um, we need to be open. And I think here in British Columbia, it is perfectly valid for us to say this is how we do things here in a gentle way, um, and model that behavior and. Um, ensure that people know what their expectations are, and that includes keeping safe distances. It includes keeping our groups small. Um, it includes if you're on your way to Alaska, then you're on your way to Alaska, and we will support you in getting there safely. So those are the things that uh, we need to remember now, um, and we need to uh, continue to do what we've been doing, which is caring for each other um, to get through this together. Do you have a follow-up, Keith? As a follow-up, uh, going back to the very first question about that 269 scientist uh, paper, I, I take it from your answer, which is quite detailed, that um, you, that will not um, convince you to change your protocols when it comes to public health measures such as physical distancing and the um, wearing of masks. No, you know, it is something that um, I have thought about, and as many people across the country and around the globe, as you can tell, um, but these are the measures that we've put in place have been based on a hierarchy of controls. So it's not just about wearing a mask or a respirator. It's not just about one thing. It's about having those layers. And we know that if we start having more transmission in the community, then we need to have other layers. We need to be more careful about them. We may need to require, uh, for example, masks in certain situations. But it is making sure that we have multiple things in place uh, to protect us, not just focusing on one thing or another. And that goes for the health care system, as well as for the measures that we're doing in the community. And I actually think it's a little bit of a tempest in a teapot in that we, we, we all agree on the extremes, and we're really sort of fussing a little bit about how much uh, we need to pay attention to the bits in the middle. And really, we need to have a layered approach that allows us to adjust as we're going through uh, the transmission in our community and, and the situation that we're in. Um, and each individual outbreak situation, for example, we might do things slightly differently depending on uh, you know, a mixed accommodation situation versus uh, a workplace situation. So I think it is important for us to continue to look at the data, to look at um, um, where we're seeing transmission events and adapt if we need to, to put in place extra measures. I also think, you know, I really hope that this stimulates some more innovation in things like more effective and easier to wear uh, masks that we can use uh, repeatedly that uh, are uh, much more effective. I, I, it discourages me that we're here after, you know, SARS in 2003 and, we, and a pandemic of H1N1 influenza in 2009, and we still don't have a decent fitting a mask that uh, can be used in, in easily in settings in, in all healthcare settings. Um, so those are the types of things I'd like to see some uh, some innovation in. We have time for one more question today. For any reporters that didn't get to ask a question, there will be a statement released later this afternoon. For recommendations on protecting families and communities from COVID-19, visit bccdc.ca. For non-medical questions about the province's COVID-19 response, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash COVID-19. And for a full listing of the Provincial Health Officer's orders, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash PHO guidance. Last question is from Tanya Fletcher, CBC. Uh, good afternoon to you both. Um, we're hearing from some family members of those in long-term care homes. They say that COVID-19 has highlighted some issues that have been happening for a long time. They're, they're talking about uh, in a, inadequate staffing levels, stories of malnutrition, dehydration, diapers left unchanged for hours, saying that those conditions aren't just in Quebec or Ontario. So how does the province plan to address these issues and is more oversight or, or regulation needed? 
Yeah, I think that's a, a, it is something, uh, and I will say particularly in long-term care, as it has uh, uncovered a number of issues that we've known about for a long time that we've been uh, trying to address. Uh, I will also say that this has exposed inequities in health and inequities in our communities as well that we need to address. But I, I'll leave it to Minister Dix to talk about long-term care. Well, I think uh, action has been taken, and more action needs to be taken in long-term care. Uh, when I became uh, Minister of Health, uh, the standard for care per resident day, as you know, in BC is 3.36 care hours per resident day. And that number, on average, was dramatically below that, on average, uh, in British Columbia. There were 75 care homes when I became Minister of Health that were under 2.9 hours per resident day, meaning they were more than three hours per resident under the standard every single week. And so that's changed. There were 75, now there are none. The care standards have gone up from, I think, uh, uh, 3.08, and at the end of this year, the average uh, care standard will be 3.37 per resident day, which at least meets the provincial standard on average, which was uh, uh, our intention. In addition to that, we made, uh, obviously, significant uh, changes. Bill 47, which was unanimously supported in the, re in the legislature, uh, it got rid of Bills 29 and 94, which uh, created a structure in long-term care that I think um, wasn't uh, either stable or healthy for many uh, residents and for many workers. So those changes and significant ones have been made, increases in and significant increases in respite care. And during this uh, pandemic, the move to a single site, uh, 8,800 workers who were at multiple sites. Now everyone is assigned to a single site and supporting that with public dollars. The, the money this uh, past week provided to long-term care homes across BC, um, the $23 million to deal with the situation uh, between uh, April and June and the subsequent funding to support visitation. All of these are significant steps. The access uh, to PPE in our supply chain, which we did earlier, than many other jurisdictions. So the situation isn't perfect, but I think we've been making significant progress. These very significant investments that have been made in the last two years uh, that have changed the structure of long-term care, we care we have to continue to work together. And the final thing I'd say is, from the beginning, everyone has been working, from the beginning of this pandemic, everyone has worked together cooperatively. Uh, unions and uh, private uh, long-term care homes and public ones and health authorities and the Ministry of Health and, and health officers in every health authority have worked together cooperatively. And that Team BC approach has really helped us during this period. We've got a lot of work done and we've got a lot more left to do, but it's been making these investments that I think we can continue to make progress. Do you have a follow-up, Tanya? Please, um, Minister, just hearing you list all of those things that, that you've done since your government uh, came in regarding long-term care homes. I know the Premier has said those same things, but uh, and he has dismissed the idea of a public inquiry. But if more evidence uh, of these types of conditions or, or proof comes forward about um, gaps in the system, would you commit to a public inquiry at long-term care facilities? Well, right now we're in the middle of uh, the pandemic. We've, we've talked today about the significant uh, issues at a couple of long-term care homes, and in particular, uh, Holy Family Care Home, which is connected to Providence Healthcare, which is one of the uh, uh, most highly respected uh, uh, health providers, nonprofit health care providers in Canada. Uh, it just shows how challenging COVID-19 is for long-term care. So right now, we're focused every day on dealing with the reality of keeping people safe of, and as we open up to visits of keeping people safe. I expect there to be reviews after uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, where we deal with these things. But we have to take action now and the action that we've taken even in the last week to support, not just to say we're going to allow visitors, but to take substantive structural action to keep seniors uh, and residents in long-term care safe, keep workers in long-term care safe, to ensure that the standard of work and the standard so that they all should expect are increased in this time is, I think, something uh, that is very positive. So, you know, there are going to be reviews, of course, of our COVID-19 response, of all of our COVID-19 response once it's over. But we're in the middle of this now, and we've got to continue to the momentum of making improvements in long-term care and doing it with all the partners in long-term care involved. 
Minister, would you mind giving a brief summary of that in French for her? En français? Yeah, please, thank you. On le veut en français. Pour nos maisons de soins de longue durée, je pense qu'on a fait des investissements importants depuis deux ans. Des investissements qui ont changé ce qui se passe, ce qui se déroule quotidiennement en long terme care. On veut dire que le moyen de, de soins, le moyen d'heures de soins euh, dans le secteur est, était en moyenne euh, à à peu près euh, 3,08. Quand j'y suis arrivé en tant que ministre de Santé, à la fin de cette année, ça va être 3,37, qui est quand même une augmentation importante. Euh, et on a pris des mesures depuis le commencement de cette pandémie qui sont importantes qui, euh, qui euh, je pense, sont toujours mis dans le, le cadre d'une euh, équipe euh, Colombie-Britannique euh, des marches euh, dans le secteur. Et je pense qu'on a, on a eu des réussites. Mais la pandémie COVID-19 est très difficile, surtout pour des personnes de troisième âge. Et il faut forcer de reconnaître qu'on est en, au sein de cet effort maintenant, au sein de cette bataille. Et il faut continuer à augmenter nos efforts. Et il y aura bien entendu des revues après euh, des, euh, cette pandémie pour euh, juger, pour améliorer nos réponses. Mais actuellement, force est de reconnaître qu'il faut continuer de travailler à fond, de protéger des gens et de leur laisser vivre pendant une période de pandémie. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much.